Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. We have some amazing guests with us. And our one round of introduction, just in one line, maybe we can start with that. And our topic of discussion today is primarily about decentralization and balancing regulations simultaneously. So we just first take one round of introduction from each one of you. And then we go ahead with the questions. All right. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm Kasper Jorgensen. I'm co-founder of Polymic protocol, so we're doing regulatory compliant fundraising on chain. And before becoming a co-founder in Polymec, I was a CFO for Web3 Foundation, so used quite a lot of time there also on the regulatory compliance side and how you do, uh, how you do, how you stay compliant as a, as a blockchain protocol. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, my name is Ankit Mehta. I work for CoinSwitch. I work as a senior manager, uh, part of the risk and compliance team. I take care of the coin listing and delisting and uh, the information security and uh, other compliance related activities as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kamlesh Nagwari, CTO of Eastman Future Tech and uh, I take care for the product development and services business and uh, quite active in the Hyperledger community, leads the Hyperledger India and has been part of the technical listing committee at Hyperledger Foundation. Hi, um, I'm Avinash. Uh, I'm from ClearTax. I'm a senior director there and uh, working on crypto products. Um, so as ClearTax, uh, like, we are the largest uh, regulatory and compliance uh, SaaS business. Uh, and now uh, we are planning to like, venture into crypto and uh, uh, occupy the space and provide a better uh, platform there. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, and I am from Horizon Institute. We founded Horizon recently a, a year ago and we are working with the regulators across the globe and of course uh, with the Indian regulators as well and we are, we are the advocacy towards regulator, you know, the regulations that should be and what are the points and as single voice of you know, people across the industry in uh, blockchain should also reach these uh, regulators and Rajat Sethi and I are the, co are the founders of uh, this platform. And uh, today I just want to ask with the first question from all of you that, uh, you know, when we, when we talk about blockchain, all the regulators, crypto, there's a lot of confusion, of course, people link with blockchain and crypto together. So what are the questions, what are the regulatory problems that you face as industry? What are the concerns that are addressed to you as industries in different uh, sectors? So we can start with you, Casper. So I think you put up the, the distinction between crypto and blockchain. And I think that's actually really, really, really key. That if we look at regulators today, they're all talking about crypto, cryptocurrencies, and they're extremely afraid. But I think that's, um, let's say it, it comes from the problems that we've seen in the market. So like uh, FTX and so on that has, uh, that has blown up. There's a lot of people lost a lot of money on something that the politician sees as crypto, uh, but it's not blockchain. It was never blockchain. They trade uh, crypto tokens, but in a centralized way. And when I look at blockchain, it's much more decentralized, permissionless, transparent. And this is something that I think we as an industry really need to go out, engage with the regulators, figure out how do we actually educate the regulators in understanding what blockchain can do and how blockchain can actually help the regulatory framework and actually make it much easier to regulate a decentralized, trustless blockchain because it's transparent. So there are certain things in the regulatory framework today that can be changed because you can trust the code, you can trust the blockchain. And of course, if you do something that's trusted or centralized, then if you have a centralized exchange, that's not necessarily different than a stock exchange today because that's also a trusted entity. But if you have something that's fully on chain, on a decentralized trustless blockchain, then it should be regulated in a different way because there's full transparency and it's a trustless environment. Got it. Yes, I would say that, um, first of all, okay, so all my views are personal. <laughs> yeah, having said that, uh, yes, government is uh, definitely supporting the uh, blockchain technology, uh, but recently, uh, the, the uh, Department of Revenue came up with the circulars uh, wherein they made PMLA applicable to us, right? Uh, the industries or the people dealing in the virtual digital assets. So it is a step uh, towards uh, kind of, uh, what do you say, uh, 
making some sort of uh, checks and balances in place which can help uh, what do you say uh, put all the uh, compliance related controls because when you have a prevention of money control uh, act applicable to you you have to deal with a lot of things uh, you even have to report the suspicious transactions as well so uh, in a way uh, the way we perform our kycs and the way we perform enhanced due diligence when we like deal as a crypto exchange right so we have to go through all those checks and balances and uh, uh, we we are working uh, closely uh, with with the uh, officials to to work on this uh, i, I so can't as, comment much so as coins which you don't have any concerns that are raised to you by the regulators so far sorry i'm saying that i was asking that what are the concerns that are usually addressed to you as part of the industry from the regulators that you have been able yeah that's what so uh, we are working closely with them uh, to okay. somehow align this process uh, to make this process smooth uh, so you have made uh, pml applicable right but there are a lot of things uh, which 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 were not there earlier and that works differently uh, if you talk about for the say uh, banking or differential issues right you can't apply the same logics here as well because it works differently so to align that uh, we 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 are working with them uh, to have those checks and balances in place uh, okay smart yeah. great kamlesh so i think uh, there are two things one is about the crypto and blockchain education so mostly people would talk about the blo uh, blockchain they thought is a crypto and that's why regulatory authorities and the challenges about the defining the proper regulation second thing i believe like uh, because technology is decentralized and uh, you can't control the technology and that's why there are different different regulation in different countries like there is a mika regulation in europe there is a uh, wara in uae so and similarly and that's why different countries are trying to maybe come to some kind of conclusion and some consensus between all the countries to come together and define a regulator could be defined by the world world bank or some economic indian uh, imf actually so this has concern with the regulation perspective i believe all right um uh, i'll just take a step back i'll i'll start like uh, what we have seen and like what what the core of the problem could be right so um um what cryptocurrency and blockchain tech has done is probably um uh, uh it's it's disrupted the economic fundamental economic models for almost uh, almost every sector and uh, what this has caused is um, um most of the regulations that we have in uh, india us etc they sort of support the traditional economic models that has been coming over from last 300 400 years um and this is the first time a tech has di disrupted the core fundamental economics right uh, whether it is currencies or whether it is uh, decentralization and anything of that right um and this uh, so so it it's getting difficult for the regulatory or authorities to fundamentally understand and then have uh, have some sort of a mechanism to even um monitor or even uh, understand how the compliance should work and uh, and this doesn't come every time every now and then like when you when you compare this with internet of things or uh, when you compare with the internet of uh, 90s um that was mostly disrupting a distribution model it never disrupted a business model the googles and facebooks fundamentally have similar business models like fmcg companies but the way uh, 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 blockchains work they have completely different business models uh, whether it is icos related to ipos the securities exchanges cannot match what icos are doing and and decentralization is completely different than the traditional model so um it it gets very um complex uh, for the regulators to get a grasp of it by understanding through the traditional lens and that's the core of the problem and that emanates into anything that emanates into taxes that can emanate into um aml cfp compliances that can emanate into kyc compliances and everywhere so unless this is addressed and at the core um of the problem and and it's addressed um by both the technologies and the regulators together um this we are going to be having this discussions and it, and it's going to take years to even evolve into getting somewhere there all right thank you so much 
So primarily we understand that, you know, there are, this, there has to be more of awareness, more of education and more of dialogue that needs to happen and not only just the, you know, one point of view, what we think. Of course, industry together has to come forward and in some form or the other with more dialogues, with more such kind of conferences wherein you really invite these regulators also as part of the discussion and uh, these things can be taken forward. Um, now I would like to ask about, you know, of course, when we talk about Web3, it's mostly about decentralization. And in that case, you know, recently, for example, on, in uh, February 2023, there was a me meeting at IMF, and they have come forward with the nine elements of how to safeguard economic, monetary, and fiscal policies, and, you know, when it comes to crypto and blockchain. And uh, so as part of this industry, how do you think that with our industry, we are able to solve and safeguard the, um, you know, the monetary part of it for the, uh, for the government. Because we are talking mostly decentralized. So when it's decentralized, how are we able to really safeguard the, um, you know, monetary policy and the regime uh, more effectively? Um, if, if I can go. Um, so I think one thing is um, what decentralization has caused is... Uh, um, we have come a long way into at least creating embedded governance um, in a in lot of projects. Um, there, um, uh, there has to be a way where we can create an embedded regulation um, in the project. So, um, and, um, well, that is one way, and, and um, my sense is that um, uh, uh, when when the the technology is handling the economics or, or the business models, um, the the regulatory should be embedded in the technology itself. Um, it cannot be uh, offline and oversight something coming from uh, uh, the traditional um, audits and things like that. Um, so that's one way to move forward. Um, uh, I don't know how or how how where the in inflection point is when it, when it comes there. Um, but the innovation should come to that effect where uh, regulation should be embedded within the technology itself. All right. So uh, adding to him like uh, this decentralization uh, could be done some proper governance using on chain and I think creating some kind of extenders whether it's the IEEE extender or, or ISO extenders because now every community building their own decentralized governance rules and their own chain mechanisms. So building some kind of extenderize from global community or kind of bringing community together, I think could uh, solve the kind of decentralization governance issues. Okay. So uh, if I talk in, in terms of uh, we as a crypto exchange, right? So uh, you know that uh, the, uh, the users, what, we, what, we, what they used to trade on, on um, Indian exchanges and other exchanges, India levied uh, TDS, right? Uh, so that they can trace how many users are trading uh, at what volume and uh, they can some sort of make a compliance uh, checks around it. And uh, yes, so very soon you will find uh, India coming up with uh, a lot of other sort of uh, uh, say rules to, to trace all these transactions which will help to uh, say understand uh, where the users are actually trading uh, is it in india or outside india if if they are trading on other exchanges as well uh, like how can they get information around it so the works are going on uh, so i believe uh, in, in the near future you will find uh, uh, some sort of uh, rules coming around it so there are efforts being made simultaneously in order to safeguard the capital control and make the regime more effective? Yes, definitely. Okay. So uh, we think that, okay, government is not working, but they are really working hard towards it. And uh, It's all about communication, you know. With yeah, yeah. So, so uh, like uh, when, when this was made applicable PML, right? So yeah. the work was going on, uh, but uh, they didn't reveal it till the time they made it applicable. But we sort of uh, in, in touch with them... Uh, and, and we used to advise as well wherever required. And we used to give our inputs from, from the industry side as well. So yes, I would say uh, government is working towards it. And uh, very soon, uh, you, you will find some sort of other uh, rules as well that, that may help uh, to ensure that uh, 
it it brings some sort of uh, what do you say? I won't say completely legitimacy, but but yeah. There so some middle ground to it. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, so I think it's again a matter of how do we actually separate the the trustless business model from the trustless business model, and. I think it's really cool that the uh, G7 is so concerned about crypto that they want to talk about it, because that means that there is quite a lot of adoption and that uh, no, they that have they to. It's being you know all the regulators globally they are you know uh, extremely active, so of course India has to follow. Yeah, and I, I think it's it's really great that they start actually looking at it, but I think it's very much of looking at what is the business model, and what information can you get directly from the technology. And what are the things that you need to have regulatory frameworks around, and how do you do reporting? Because if you are, if you're running an exchange, or if you're running a, a more trust-based business model, dealing in the crypto industry, that that breaks a lot of the information that you have on chain. So if it's fee and on and off ramps, it's it could be exchanges or uh, lending platforms that all of a sudden you have a break in the immutability of the chain because you are because you are transferring the tokens into a wallet that's not necessarily one person but where you have quite a lot of different tokens in so that that is an area where it makes sense to have some kind of regulatory framework because it you you don't have the full information on chain but you also have the the full decentralized chains where you have everything directly on chain and I don't necessarily see there's a lot of necessity there for doing a lot of reporting requirements on very trustless business models and very decentralized business models, but maybe more regulation about what is true decentralization, how do I understand decentralization, and then trust in the immutability of the, of the chain and the, um, and the transactions that are there, because it's a fully public ledger. Anyone and the authorities can go in and get all the transaction information that they want, do all kinds of analysis on it. So making sure that the authorities understand that those differences so that we don't end up in just over-regulating the crypto industry as such and then killing off the new business models, but having a framework that sort of caters for the current business models because those ones are really key to crypto, but also have a way of saying if it's properly decentralized or if it's properly trustless, then you can actually still uh, trust what is on what is on chain, and that you can build those decentralized uh, and trustless business models as well. Okay, great. So that brings me to my next question, which is, uh, you know, are you, are you aware, or are, you know, there are several sandboxes across the globe. Like MAS is working very closely, uh, you know, with many technologies that's coming out of the sandbox, and there's a lot of innovation happening there. So in India, uh, if you look at the sandbox's adoption. Have you been able to, you know, except for Telangana, is there a lot of adoption across? So I would like to know from all of you. So yeah, so I can go. So in India, in the Telangana, they have a Web3 sandbox to, to promote the and kind of define the regulatory compliances around, around the Web3 ecosystem. And there is another uh, uh, sandboxes in uh, IFSCA, this is a, in Gip City, Ahmedabad. So they is kind of defining the international financial uh, Kind of uh, kind of complies the sandbox, and even recently they uh, kind of incubated a couple of uh, Web3 projects. To and even um, one of my projects also going to be included in the, the sandbox. So like carbon credit, uh, how you could uh, be trade the carbon credit outside India. So there's lots of concern uh, and uh, set up by the regulatory things. So I think this IFSC and this Web3 sandbox, but Telangana is the two initiative which I've known. Um. So, I mean, so my opinion here is that, um, uh, um, so th the two things, right? So one is, um, when I think of regulatory, um, um, I think of like, uh, just like traffic lights. So, um, um, uh, it's, a, it's something that is there to prevent chaos. Uh, there's uh, something for uh, you to have some uniformity uh, in what we do. Um, and. The sandboxes uh, that I see in India, especially like um, uh, the, there's a lot of regulatory sandboxes even in um, uh, other fields as well, like IRDA is doing it on insurance and other things. Um, but the, uh, the, the regulatory overlens for especially crypto projects um, is, is still a red light uh, un until that has like 
all the three colors, um, the sandboxes environment is not going to um, uh, produce innovation that is um, uh, that is true to uh, or, or that uh, uh, um, that that is true to the technology. So um, once that regulatory clarity comes, at least in India and also a lot of other countries in in this thing, the sandbox can really produce innovation where regulation can probably. Um, assist technology and technology can assist re regulation in both ways. So um, I, I, my perspective is that we have still not reached there and once we reach there it, it could be a lot more different picture. Yeah, so I don't know that much about the Indian regulatory landscape but actually what I noticed here in engaging with the community here is that regulatory compliance is actually very much at the forefront of developers here, of the engineers, of wanting to understand how they actually stay regulatory compliant. And I think having sandbox environments or, or similar is actually really good to come out publicly and talk about your business model. I think that's the same thing as, uh, it's a bit of the same thing as we did in, uh, in Web3 Foundation of engaging with the regulators. Like if you don't have any, like go and talk to the regulators. They are not, uh, they are not bad people. They are, they are people that actually want to understand what is, the, uh, what, what is it that you're building, what, what can it do, and they can also help you because they can give you feedback one-to-one. -one. They might not say things publicly, but you need to understand how they're thinking, and you can educate them, and they can educate you. And obviously, if you're doing a project where you want to avoid and or circumvent regulation, you, you have a problem in, in, anyway. So I think if, you, if you're building in a, in a way that you actually want to be regulatory compliant, go and have a talk with the regulators, figure out what they're thinking about what you want to build. It's a much more effective way of doing it and, and trying it out rather than to avoid it and put your head in the sand and then hope they don't find you. Because let's face it, it's like uh, the, the world is so connected and if your success becomes a big, big success uh, and and you're not regulatory compliant, then at some point they're going to knock on your door and say, hey, what is it that you built? This is actually not regulatory compliant. So, yeah, I will always say go talk to the regulators where, where you're regulated or in your bigger markets and make sure they understand what you're building and understand what concerns they have. Because at that point you have a possibility to actually change your product or making sure that you're regulatory compliant and, and you get some feedback because, uh, because otherwise, you just end up still being a small fish or they will kill your project once it's a huge success and you don't want that either. So, uh, so I, I would say, yeah, engage with the regulators, educate them about what you're doing. I think that's the, that's the best way of going forward. This is the most idealistic situation, but this is not, not how it is going and people say, okay, we keep communicating to and fro, you know, we'll stop doing business and then people are just moving to Dubai. So it's just that, yes, I know about engagement, about communication, everything is extremely important. But at the same time, um, you know, when we talk about these, the way these uh, communication with, with the sandboxes and everything is happening, I think now it's more open. There's a lot of communication going on and it's more, there's a lot of adoption. So, Ankit. Like, yeah, like government is uh, working with, um, few startups, uh, even uh, uh, recently they were working with the Polychain Labs as well uh, to make uh, the, the certificates of the, of the people, professionals, uh, live on the blockchain uh, very recently, like one or two weeks back. So yeah, there are use cases around it. Uh, uh, previously, uh, even the uh, Mumbai uh, uh, police were working with the, again, uh, one of the blockchain company, right, to launch the FIRs on uh, in, in, on the blockchain as well. In the past, uh, Kolkata government uh, made the birth certificates live on the blockchain as well. So there have been uh, use cases. Uh, so we'll have to come up with the uh, use cases uh, which which will help uh, the uh, people at large, right? Then of course, uh, government is ready to help, uh, and and they are of course working towards. Uh, the blockchain technology, yeah. All right. Uh, so, you know, I would, of course, everybody is working globally right now. And, you know, when you look at all the examples across the globe, so what is it that you can recommend, for example, if given a chance with the regulators, with the government, in terms of how with technology intervention, 
you know, we can really have a top-notch incubator which can help them become an, uh, uh, you know, technology uh, adopter, basically. So is there, is there any example that you would like to quote that can uh, help the government or regulators become uh, more innovative through some kind of technology uh, intervention? So, good. So, about the data regulation and privacy, I think you must be heard like nowadays like consensus and uh, uh, Polygon started the ZK EVM based chain, zero knowledge proof chain. So, you, data is already zero knowledge proof, you not sharing the data on on chain. This is one. I think, and also, there are multiple mechanisms in different, different chains. You could create private data, you could create some off-chain thing. Uh, like for example in hyperledger fabric there is a private data concept you no need to write the data on chain completely you could write on some kind of uh, private database and just write the proof on the chain and similar to like ZK EVM best uh, implementation by polygon and consensus um, I, I, I don't have any great examples of this but um, uh, what I have seen uh, 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 there's uh, there's decent uh, um, especially in the um, uh, in the KYC section uh, I've seen a lot of new innovations happen um, uh, with uh, with quite a few startups we had a few um, present yesterday also um, and that is like a one step towards basically uh, providing decentralization I mean the whole core of the uh, uh, this thing is that can I provide verification without with being anonymous um, and uh, that sort of has been disrupted now and the next step would be can I still remain anonymous and, and be regularly compliant um, uh, without the government or any of the regulatory authorities really happening to know uh, um, uh, you know my probably my identity and things like that so uh, uh, how would that come through and how, how, how would that happen is, is, uh, is, is still a uh, challenge and uh, but this f few projects that we see uh, every now and then which is trying to disrupt this and um, we can even see uh, a lot of startups that have uh, created uh, good architecture for uh, um, AML CFT compliance that is coming through when um, um, when this uh, exchange is happening between different uh, um, uh, centralized exchanges you know when when there's uh, withdrawal and deposits happening on different centralized exchanges so uh, there's good um, uh, examples over there um, um, but I think there's still a lot more to be done Sorry. okay so I was saying that, uh, you know, when you look at uh, examples globally, you know, there are a lot of tech. For example, I'll give you recently when Tim Draper was in India, you know, he mostly talked about, he had done a lot, lot of road shows and he talked about GovTech, that we should do a lot of things with Web3 and blockchain integration with the government tech and the problems that Web2 has not been able to solve, Web3 will. And then governments, most of the governments have come out saying that, you know, we really need in terms of the, if there are any such kind of uh, innovation happening globally which is making the task of the government easy you know in terms of technology intervention you make you make some kind of uh, you know for example there is some automated dashboard wherein what's happening globally there are trends that are showing dynamic trends happening globally and what should be the adoption with the government so what I was asking that since it's a global community that you know all the all of you from the industry work with so is there any example or a wish list that you have that how technology through technology intervention government or the regulators their task becomes much easier in terms of getting this as a, uh, as an incubator as a, a, you know as um, launch more such kind of uh, web3 and blockchain products which which helps them also in terms of their initiatives what they are trying to see so it's all about education basically and also technology intervention yeah so one good example would be uh, the land registry right uh, so you take one example if you have to sell something or if you have to buy, uh, you need to get all the chain documents. You need to understand who was the previous owner, whether he has all the documents or not. You have to go to different departments, right? And again, for the same sort of documents, you have to go multiple departments. It's a lot of back and forth. But if you have everything on the blockchain, right, 
you don't have to uh, juggle around between too many departments. There is no inconsistency. Moreover, you won't find a lot of court cases uh, for all those things, right? So uh, it's, it's one of the example wherein if you can bring all those things on blockchain, it will be easy to identify who's the buyer, who's the seller, and this will make life easier for each and every one because there are thousands and lakhs of cases, civil cases uh, pending in the court, right? So this will in a way help uh, to make everything streamlined and, and you can close your deal very soon, yeah. Panelist, I'm sorry to interrupt since we're running short of time, so I request okay, you to one last consider question. the time. Yeah, thank okay, you. It's about data sovereignty. So, you know, most of the top blockchain, when you look at the servers which are based outside India, so how does it, because this defies the logic of data sovereignty, so how do you deal with that? Because that is, data is important for any policy makers that you look at across the globe. And when you look at the, the, the servers are mostly located outside India, so how, how do you balance that? I guess it's a matter of having access to data and make sure that you don't, that you don't block access to data. Usually, I worked on, there are other countries, I think, that have the same rules, that they want the data in the country because it's underneath the laws of the country. The good thing about the distributed network is that no one can shut it off. So if you have a proper distributed network, it shouldn't actually matter because you can really trust in the fact that everybody have access to it and no one can shut it down. So then you always have access to the data and everybody has access to the data. So you create much more transparency on it. So I think that goes again back to the like, how do we make sure that there is access to it all the time, that there's proper decentralization, and you don't have someone at the end that can cut off the data stream. Of course, if you have a different business model that's not fully on chain, I think that's a different thing because the Indian authorities need to have access to it. But yeah, look at, looking at how, what we're doing at Polymec, we are everyone that invests in startups via Polymec, their KYC will be registered on chain for everybody to see via their verifiable credential. So if there's a problem, any authority can look on chain and see, hey, I want to understand who that person is because there's something wrong with that transaction. And they can go to the KYC provider and get the information with a court order in the country that they operate in. So I think that's a way of where you can actually utilize blockchain technology to make sure that authorities always have access to it. Yeah, so as part of the Information Technology Act and uh, in that, uh, it is mentioned specifically by the CERT that uh, all the exchanges have to keep the customer's data in India. So there are clauses which uh, gives us specific guideline as to where the data should host, right? So uh, we have to keep our data within India and even as per the PMLA, uh, we have to ensure that all the customer's data reside in uh, the India. So yeah, I can quote uh, the certain requirements and, and uh, yes, of course, as per the PMLA, we have to ensure that the customer's data remains uh, within India itself. So when you use any cloud platform, you have to ensure that uh, the availability zone in, is in Mumbai or Hyderabad, not in Singapore, because most of the uh, AWS cloud platforms have their uh, availability zones in Singapore and you would see uh, like no one gets deep down into it where the AZs are there, but yeah, you need to ensure that uh, the data or, or the, the cloud pro provider what you are using, right? So they should have the availability zone in India. So yeah. Thank you. So uh, I think uh, in the blockchain now, you can build some kind of self sovereign identity kind of thing, implementation. So even like Kilt protocol based on Polygon is do the same thing. You're just writing the proof of the, your transaction on list identity on the blockchain and then putting all your private data on your wallet itself. And I think this is the trend nowadays, building the DIDs on blockchain. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, this is a this is fairly simple problem, I feel. Um, uh, uh, especially with the jurisdiction, with most of the data having to stay in India. Uh, the the backend servers that store the data that uh, they can be they can be in, in mostly in Indian jurisdiction, but um, and it can still be decentralized. And like uh, what we saw with um, Stack OS that they presented, 
you could have different mainnets that are just sitting in India and uh, they can, uh, uh, you, you could still provide a decentralized data platform for most of the uh, customers. So that's fairly easy problem to solve. Um, um, but I, 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 uh, I think the more difficult problem would be like, what do you do with something like Polkadot or Ethereum chain, then what, uh, where, where, who do you think is the jurisdiction holding those uh, tokens? So that would be more complex for me. All right, thank you so much. So th this brings us to an end of this conversation. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, I feel it was very balanced conversation in terms of pro-regulators, not many issues, and we are trying to work in terms of consistent, and there's a lot of coordination that's happening with the regulators and the representation of your industry. So yeah, it's a good conversation. There are no complaints. That's what you know, we, we can conclude. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you.